life like you promised, Jesus. I don't ever want to thirst again. Fill us with your spirit, God. God, we honor you. We lift you up, God. There is none like you. You are strong and mighty, God. You are mighty in battle. You are holy. We say, have your way in this place. God, we say, fill us. Fill us from top to bottom. Every empty place, God. Father, every deserted place. Overflow in that place. We crown you as king, God. We say, be enthroned on our praises. We bow down before you. We say, you are holy. You are holy and there's none like you. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to have your way in this place. Change us, God. Teach us. Lead us. We submit to you. You can have our heart, God. We call every thought into order in Jesus' name right now to focus on your word. Father, I ask for an anointing that makes preaching easy. Father, put an anointing in this place that makes hearing your word a sweet delight. In Jesus' name. Amen. They got me ready to throw this microphone to the back of the room. I wear a button up today. Y'all know I started to wear a hoodie and layer it with something, you know what I mean? And come in here looking like all of Ohio. My wife laid this shirt at the end of the bed so I wouldn't have to go look for nothing. She know I'm a simple man and she knew what I was gonna put on. Had I known she was dressing me like the praise and worship team, I would have walked to, the, to my closet and got me something better. It's a setup, it's a setup. That's all right, I'm gonna pick her clothes out later. Where you at now? <laughs> Baby, just put on what's on the end of the bed there. See, husbands, you gotta learn. It's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. Put on that ugly shirt she wants you to wear. But later on, <laughs> if you're single, I ain't talking to you. If you're single, you shouldn't even be buying a person you date any type of clothes. Don't even, don't even buy him stuff you like to see him wearing. For two reasons. One, you shouldn't be trying to dress or undress him. And two, when y'all break up, the next girlfriend or boyfriend gonna make him throw it away. Imagine what it feels like to see your ex with their necks wearing something you bought them. Imagine how the devil hates you because he sees God with the new worshiper putting on the garment of praise that he was supposed to wear. See, see, let me tell you something. When I worship, I'm worshiping God, but I'm making sure that all the hell know. I'm, I, I want you to see what you could have been, what you should have been. I want you to be reminded that the courts that I'm walking into with praise, you used to hover over, but now you've been cast out of them. That I got access that you don't have no more. How many of y'all ready for some violence? John 8, 38 through 47 says this. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do not that which ye have seen with your father. Excuse me, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus saith unto them, imagine having a debate with Jesus about who the Father is. Imagine having a debate with Jesus about which Father you're submitted to. Jesus is saying, I, I'm doing what I've seen from my Father and you're doing what you've seen from your Father. If I was them, I would say, tell me how I get this adoption. He said, our Father is Abraham. 
Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Somebody say deceived. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Y'all know some folks can't hear the word of the Lord. They hear the words out the mouth, but they don't hear what's being said. You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you would do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh, he, uh, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So if he is your father and he's the father of lies, that make you a lie. Right? I mean, if, if, if A plus B equals C, then C minus B must equal A. This is basic algebra. That if he the father of lies and he's your father, guess what you are? You's a lie. You a lie, your mama a lie for laying with this liar. <laughs> your mama ain't no liar. Except once in a while. <laughs> Six days a week. It's all right, it's all right. <laughs> Oh God. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. They don't not believe him because they don't like him. They don't not believe him because uh, he has a reputation. They don't like him because they don't believe him because he tells the truth. And the truth is not in them. They believe the lie. It says, uh, which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Revelation 11. When the church hear Revelation, they start shaking. Revelation 11. I'll read 12 verses out of here. It says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Let me stop right here for a quick second. Whenever I get up here and I start exhorting, I mean, it's because I can't sing, really. So I'm just going to be totally honest. If I could sing, I'd come up here and get up into song. And then I would sing into the scripture. Y'all see how these preachers do it. That's, be that's because they all used to be praise and worship leaders. Got mad at the pastor and started a church. Now they can sing and kind of preach because they've been exhorting in between songs for 10 years and they want to make me look bad. I can rap. Rappers since I was 10. Come on. Hey, drop the beat. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Y'all didn't know what I was going to do. Y'all didn't know what I was going to do. Nobody rapping in church. Who rap in church? I talking about oh this is what I was saying when I get up here and I exhort I can't sing so what I can do is push in the momentum of where the Spirit of God is going I can push the power I can I can I can push you along I, I, can, I can I can cheerlead you on in right for, 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 for folks who don't understand that understand this it's important because the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Measure them. Your life is going to be measured. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. Guess who don't get counted? For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall uh, they tread underfoot. 40 in two months, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, say two witnesses, 
and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That's three and a half years. Anytime you read Revelations and you see it says uh, three and a half years or time, times and half a time or 42 months or 1,260 days, that's all three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God of the earth. And if any man will, will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Somebody yell violence. He must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead, their dead bodies to be put in the grave. Because they hate us. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt in the earth. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. You may be seated. I, um, me breaking up when I'm reading a little bit because these guys are playing so good behind me that it makes me want to stop and talk on every line that I'm reading and I have to overcome that feeling <laughs> and stay disciplined so that I don't over preach what the Lord has given me but I, I would stop and preach on every single one of these here lines there's a picture being painted here we're going to talk about it this is this is what happens is is John is given a read. He's given a read, a, 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 a read a, like a rod. And if you look that word up like a rod in the uh, Greek there, it means a rod, and it also means more, more literally a pen, like a writer's pen. So he's basically saying, go measure this and give an account. There's, and, and what is he measuring? He's measuring the temple. So, so we know, per scripture, that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, this is the accurate portrayal of Scripture. You are not the church. I'm not the church. You are the temple. I am the temple. Uh, I know y'all struggle with that because, because no matter what I teach up here, y'all be on social media seven days a week listening to the memes and, and, and the liars. You understand the makers of your memes and the people post you share that their father is the devil? It's called controlled opposition. That, that if it sounds like Jesus, it'll deceive those who don't really know Jesus, but think they know Jesus. What do you mean those who think they know Jesus but don't know Jesus? I don't know. Let me paint you a picture. Jesus said in the end that we all go stand before him, and he's going to separate the goat from the sheep. And he's going to tell these ones, depart from me. I never knew you. And here's what they say. But I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. Did mighty works in your name. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. But they thought they knew him. Right? Uh, these guys that are talking here to Jesus in John chapter 8 said, uh, we serve one God. We serve one God. So if they think they serve God and Jesus is telling them you don't serve God, what do you think that some of the folks that's, that's in your path are doing? You can't co-sign everything. You got to evaluate everything. Since I'm going to be measured, I'm going to measure. So, so again, you are the temple, I'm the temple. The church is us gathered. 
This is the definition in the Greek. Anytime Jesus used the word, uh, the New Testament used the word church, it is a coming out from where you are and gathering together. Uh, Jesus being the chief cornerstone and each one of us being a piece of that built up into the temple of God. But you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost, but you ain't the church. You should take that out your vocabulary. I'm the church. The church ain't the, no, the church ain't the building. The church is the gathering. The church can gather in the park. The church can gather in the parking lot. The church ain't you in your living room, though. You're the temple. You're the temple. The, the church ain't getting measured. The temple is. So, so since you're the temple of the Holy Ghost, here's what's getting measured. The temple and the altar and the worshiper. So there, here's an evaluation. Where is our altars at? Where do we find altars at? Where do we make altars at? What have we set apart as sacred? One of the first things that we are told is to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. We're told this by example from God himself. He worked six days and rested on the seventh. And so where is our altar? You know how I know a lot of people don't have altars? Because you got to push them to worship. This is an exposing because the altar is filled with worship. It is a sacrifice that you lay upon an altar. We're supposed to give God the sacrifice of praise. So whoever you have to push to praise exposes that they ain't been to an altar in a long time. It's quiet in this Baptist church. We're not Baptists if you're here for the first time, just so you know. So you measure the altar. You measure the worshipers within the altar. So, so, so when you think I can give God what I want, he knows my heart, the thing is he does because it's being measured. There is an evaluation. That whole God knows my heart concept is a scary concept because God knows your heart more than you. He knows your heart is deceitfully wicked. He knows the things you have never told anybody that you really want to do even though you're doing the right thing. God does know your heart. So, so there's a measurement. Here's what, what he says to leave out, those in the outer courts. Those who don't approach the altar, those who are not close to me, those, those who don't have a worship, those, what those are, those are Gentiles that are going to trample worship. There, this is what we, we see scripture says, don't cast your pearl to the pig, or what's precious to the dog, because they will trample it underfoot. This is when you get the Gentiles on the outer court, what they do is they look at worship and they insult it. And watch how close you can be. David was a worshiper. His wife, Micah, mocked his worship. They lived in the same house, slept in the same bed. Not every night. David had a lot of women. But enough. enough. He did. <laughs> but a lot of nights, though. Enough. <laughs> David wasn't perfect, all right? <laughs> anyway. Slept in the same bed, right? Understood the same law. Yet she's barren because she mocks his praise. And so when, when, when we start dealing with the outer court, you got to stop thinking of physical temple because those who trample worship are the ones who don't get measured in the count. Uh, that, that will look around and say, it don't take all that. Okay. Those who say, who say oh, I got, God, God knows, I'm just going to do this. Well, he gave us his word. We're supposed to obey his word. His word says clap. His word says shout. His word says lift up your heads, all your gates. His word says praise him in a timbrel, praise him in a dance, praise him on a clashing cymbal. These are things that the scriptures say. So, so, so your cool, calm, and collective don't impress the Holy Ghost. That, that, that I'm chilling don't get you no points with God. Too many people standing in a sanctuary trying to be cool enough to catch the view of somebody that's attractive. When they ain't been in an atmosphere to catch the view of the Lord all week long. Um, so you got these prophets. Somebody say these prophets. These witnesses. These witnesses. You know the word witness in the Greek means martyr. It's the word martyrs. So when we say, I'm going to be a witness, uh, that 2021 version of witness, of I'm just going to tell you about the Lord, that's not a witness. You don't got a witness if you're not willing to die for it. When we, when we are witnesses for him, when, they, when the Bible calls them, they went out and witnessed or were witnesses for him in the book of Acts, they were martyrs. 
They all were killed for what they believed. How many of us are willing to die for what we believe? No, seriously, like, like how many of us are willing to die? This is violence month. Uh, because, because they willing to die. The world is willing to die for what they believe. Let me tell you something. How I grew up, I was willing to die for everything I believed growing up. And it ain't make no sense. I, didn't, I ain't own no property on the blocks I represented. It just was written. <laughs> was written on the blocks I grew up on and was willing to die for it. These men were willing to die for the gospel, willing to be beaten for the gospel, willing to be tormented, for, willing to be jailed for the gospel. We ain't willing to lose a job for the gospel. We ain't willing to get blocked on Facebook for the gospel. We'll change the gospel so we ain't got to die for it. It's all right. It's all right. Don't worry. It's going to get worse before it get better. It might not get no better than this. <laughs> it's only go, no, it's only going to get good if y'all, if y'all be, be, you know, with the, with the. Otherwise, I'm going to draw it out and make it whack. <laughs> you got these witnesses, these martyrs, these prophets. And check this out. They have their time. This is what we have to understand, that, that there is a time. They have their time. Uh, it says 42 months they're going to prophesy in sackcloth. Right? So there is a set time for, for the productivity to be increased for the, for the witnesses, for the prophets. These two uh, witnesses that's going to be sent, or, or excuse me, that's going to represent and, and preach fire and all of this, and I know everyone's got a different idea, and that's fine. I'm going to preach what I know in my spirit. All right? Because everyone's like, it's Elijah and, 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 and Enoch. No, it's not. It's Moses and Elijah. No, it's, no, 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 not so much. Here, here's the two witnesses because it describes them in the book. It says these are the two olive trees next to the two candlesticks. Now, if you read scriptures where it talks about this prophecy in the Old Testament, there, there are two candlesticks that don't need to be connected to anything else that burn eternally because of the oil that flows directly from the olive tree feeds right into the candlestick. So these two olive trees and two candlesticks is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. If you want to read prophecy. Now, if you just want to go picking out people who ain't died in the Bible because it's appointed every man to die once, that's fine. Go for it. But this is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Uh, this is why Jesus makes sure to, to tell us to understand that it's not one but two. That, that man don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. It's not just about knowing the scriptures alone, but the Holy Spirit that he said, I'm sending you, is going to tell you everything he hears from the Father. So, so, so you don't live just by the word, you live by the Spirit. You don't live just by the truth, you live by the Spirit, which is why he, who is the living word, is sitting on a well and said, I'm going to give you a well inside of you that springs up into eternal life. Uh, I'm, I'm the word, but I'm going to give you a flow. That's why the Bible tells us then that the Lord is seeking such to worship him. He's seeking such to worship him. Uh, that those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Because there's two witnesses, the spirit and the truth. The Bible says this of men. It says that men, uh, they swear by something greater than themselves. And it says that then they make an oath for confirmation. To do it, end all for all strife. He says, God, wanting to show a more abundant, immutable thing. Uh, since he cannot tell a lie. Think about this. He can't swear on nothing bigger than himself. There is nothing bigger than him. So what he did was, by these two immutable things, he secured us. His son, who was a forerunner in the order of Melchizedek, and his spirit. And he confirmed it with an oath. I'll be with you always. So, 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 so th these two, say two. two. These are the two witnesses. If you only know the word and don't know the spirit, you're missing it. If you only know the spirit and never study your word, you're missing it. Because the Lord is seeking such. If he's seeking such, that tells me something. It's not widespread. It's not in abundance. Anything you have to look for. It's not readily available. Uh, anything you got to seek out is because it's hidden or, or, or it's, it's limited. Um, 
um, when, something, when Christmas comes around and there's this new toy, everybody, this PS5 or whatever, I don't know. How I many of y'all got a PS5? Nope. Me neither, right? <laughs> you know why? Because they're not readily available. I don't play games, but that's just the thing is you have to really seek it out. People go buy them, and you got to go look on eBay and look over here and look over there to find this rare item. God is seeking this rare item, those who worship in spirit and truth. The problem with it being uh, not widespread is that those who worship must worship this way. This is what the Bible says. They must worship this way. And so here's the confrontation. The woman at the well asked Jesus, she says, um, what mountain do we worship on? My people say we worship on this mountain. Yours say they worship on that mountain. Um, Jesus said it's not going to be in a mountain, nor in Jerusalem. He said, but the day is coming and now is where true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. True worshipers must worship in spirit and truth because God is spirit. So we worship him by his witnesses. Y'all know worship is evangelism? Understand this, that if these are the two witnesses, your worship should preach a message. If you worship by these two witnesses, your worship should preach a message. Worship is evangelism. The reason some of y'all who invite people to church, they don't never come or don't never accept it is because you invite them with your words, but not with your worship. When your worship doesn't match your words, you're just talking. This is, this is, this is a, a, that form of godliness lacking the power thereof. Here's how worship is evangelistic. If you lift Jesus up, he draws all men unto him. If he be lifted up, he draws all men unto him. Lifting him up draws men. If men ain't drawn, he ain't lifted up. If more people could tell you about your car payment than they can about your tithe, he ain't lifted up. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean this. People don't know you tithe, but they know the deal you got on that car. Because here's the conversation that most people will have. I took mine down there. You know I owed this much. They gave me this much over what I owed, so I, I got to put that on this, and then my payments is this much lower than they was before. You got a testimony, don't you? Oh, Rick Case. <laughs> oh, Rick Case testimony. No Jesus Christ testimony, though. No, people know when it's good, they know when it's bad. You say, man, I, I, owe, I owe this much uh, on it, but it was only worth this much. But look, they rolled, look how God favored me. They rolled that debt. On, so now I owe more than this one's worth. <laughs> right, we brag on that. But never, never about how our debt was rolled off. So, so if they can tell you, if they can tell you about your payments and not about your financial security in Christ, he ain't lifted up. If they can tell you more about where you buy your clothes than your praise, than the garment you're really supposed to be wearing. If they, and if they ask where you shop at but not where you worship at, it should be an indicator to you. It's all right. Because if we lift him up, he draws on men. It's evangelism. Here's why else it's evangelism. Corporate worship is evangelism. I had this conversation, I think, with, was it UM? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> we were talking. But, but if people drive by the, the church parking lot, any church, on a Sunday, and there's two cars out front, you just, people just keep on driving. I, if I go by a restaurant and ain't nobody eating in it, I ain't stopping. I, I, I'm going to go find the one with the parking lot is full. Uh, that's a testimony. Uh, the parking lot should be so full of worshipers that people got to stop and see if there's a car show going on over there. That, that when they come into this atmosphere, that, that, that this draws people because our worship is a witness. It should. It should cause us to go out. So since we're supposed to worship... In spirit and truth, these are the witnesses uh, that the Lord uses to preach fire in the earth, which means it's more than one because we all have the ability to be filled with that fire, fan into flames, uh, the gift that is within you, so that when we speak, we ain't got to be timid. That's why Paul tells Timothy, God is not giving you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind, because you have this ability to, to, to defeat any enemy that comes before you and devour them. But you know who wants that seat? 
The devil wants that seat. He wants the seat that you put God in. He wants the seat that you worship in. Um, that's why the Revelation says, when you see the abomination of desolation in the temple of God, sitting in the seat of God to be worshiped as God, which is why you can deal with people who say, I serve God, but Jesus is like, no, you serve the devil. You just, just because you're in the temple do not mean that you are in the family. Just because you came in does not mean that you got in. Um, the enemy... If, if, if God wants us to worship in spirit and truth by his witness to immutable things that cannot be changed to make sure that we know the abundance of his love, the enemy wants to come in and get you to worship in flesh and lies. Look, there's truth and spirit and flesh and lies. So you got a lot of people who go to church and, and they go to churches that make them feel good. Oh, they like to feel good, but they've exchanged the truth. They come to church and say, make me feel better about the week I just went through and prepare me for the week I'm going into. No, 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 none of this is about you. None of this is about me. All of this is about him. We come to give him the glory. We don't come to be picked up off the mat. And, and, and this ain't the corner for the boxing ring where it's like, here go, here go a little water, sprinkle that on your head. All right, now get back out there. This is not that. This is not that. This is, this is where we come to exalt God. So there's a lot of people who come in, and in their flesh, they want to feel good. Yeah. And so they grab onto lies and false doctrine and feelings that rule them because they want, they want to exchange this truth for a lie. You would rather believe that this was about you. You choose your churches based on what's about you. Maybe not this crowd. Because if you ain't left yet, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> but, but, but people choose it based on what is about them. Do I like their coffee? Do I like the kids' ministry? What my kids think about it? How long is the preacher? Oh, how cool is this or how big is this? Are they going to ask me to do anything? Or is it my convenience? There's an exchange of truth for a lie. So there's a set time. 42 months. But guess what? There's also a time limit. There's a set time and a time limit that this all happens. And then there is a time of redemption. So there's a time where God is doing his work. And then there's a time where the work ceases. And the world cheers. And then there's a time of redemption where the work is exalted. Let me, let me show it to you how I look in the world. The witnesses are working. For 42 months. They work here for 42 months. We're talking Revelation, yes? Yeah. All right, so when you deal with Revelation, you can't just read Revelation. You have to go back and read Daniel and a couple of the other prophets. And Daniel, he talks about his, his 70 weeks prophecy, okay? The 70th week, the last week, and it's a week of years, so it's seven years. One week is seven years in the prophecy. So now we're getting instruction on the 70th week. In the 70th week, for three and a half years, the witnesses are going to consume anything that comes at them. Why do you think no matter what they try, they can't, they, they can't squash the church right now? The real church. I mean, there's a lot of churches folding. They folding. They knees buckling. Wrist is limp. Backbones is jelly. Uh, but, 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 but the real church, and I ain't talking about just square root, I'm talking about the real church. There's more than just us out here. Uh, they can't, ain't nothing they can do. They can make a mandate, we ain't, we ain't with it. They can, they can, they can say, you got to take this, we ain't with it. Uh, there's nothing they can do for a period. So in the 70th week, you got three and a half years where you're going to really push that work. But guess what? The reason we got to push it is because there's a time limit. Because halfway through that week, that's the end of that. The enemy is given power to overcome the saints. This is what it says. And kill them. So, so there's going to be a period where the word of God and the spirit of God will be banned from all places. Will be shut down from everywhere. You can't witness to nobody in your job. Because they'll pull you up out of there and put you in jail. That sounds complicated, but all you got to do is look at China. They got to have underground churches now. Um, this is luxury. 
But there's a day coming where that's going to be silence. For three, year, for three days, it says, which is three years. Um, and the whole world's going to cheer about it. Because what we teach torments them. Think, and it don't even have to be accurate. Think of how it's worded. Um, that me believing in God is offensive to you. That me believing that a man is a man and a woman is a woman is offensive to you. That me believing my child shouldn't be taught this right here is offensive to you. By me not wanting to take that shot, it's offensive to you. By me, st- I mean, how, how does me believing this torment you? Except the light always exposes the dark, and the darkness could not extinguish it. Just me showing up exposes you. This is David showing up to the fight with cheese sandwiches and Elliot behind the rock. He was fine until David showed up. But when David showed up, and he made all of them look like cowards. This is what happens. This is why you're a hater. So what did Eliab do? His brother gets up and accuses him. You hear to see a fight. I know you're proud with them few sheep you got and starts insulting him. This is, this is what happens. So, so they're excited. The world gets excited when we get removed, when we get silenced, when, we, when, when we're not allowed to move. So you got three and a half years that, you, that we're going to move heavily. Then you got about three years where the church is going to be banned from a lot of stuff. And they're going to be happy about it. But guess what happens after that? Because there's one day left or one year left. Then the power of God falls. And his witnesses are, are lifted up and called to him in the heaven. This is then, if you put this in the picture of, of prophecy, don't worry, I'm going to get out of here and, and run on with it. If you, <laughs> this is where Jesus comes on his mountain and calls his to him right before he pours out the vows of wrath. So this, the, those who are with him are called to him on the mountain while he pours out the vows of wrath. And the wrath of God then is poured out on all the unrighteousness. So, so, so this is, you know, we go through them seven years, but that last year while he's dealing with this, we stand in there with him like this. And what happens, it says, is that they look up and they're terrified. They're terrified. I'd be terrified, too, if the one I said wasn't real just cracked the sky and was standing on his mountain and the dead rose with him first. I'd, I'd be terrified, too, because I said he was a myth. I called him a sky daddy, compared him to Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, and now he's on that mountain, and his hair is white like wool, and his eyes like fire, and his feet like brass, and he's got a double-edged sword in his mouth and many crowns. I think at that point, I wish I had listened to them witnesses, but, but look, we have a time. Because this is our time to make sure we ain't the only ones pulled to the mountain. And then that, that redemption is a time, it's a time of gain because uh, to, to die is gain. You know, so we'll exist here for these times. We'll be sustained in these times. We'll fight in these times. We'll be removed for a certain time. And then at the moment of death, we gain. That's why you ain't got to be scared to die. Why does God need these witnesses, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and those who really stand on that in these days? Why does he need that? I'm I'm just going to choose violence right now, okay? (laughs) There we go. Violence loading. That was all educational. (laughs) So, So here's why. The church in prior days... Previous generations, uh, and even some lingering over today, have taught a Luciferian version of Jesus. A Luciferian version of Jesus. Um, How can that be? Because any Jesus that's not the true Jesus is a lie. And he don't have to look like a devil. The, The devil parades like an angel of light. So it's easy to teach a smaller version or a corrupted version of Jesus, a Jesus, a hippie Jesus, or, uh, you know, a men's conference Jesus, or political Jesus, or any of these fake Jesuses that, that, that deal in one area and neglect all the rest of the scripture. He said you can hang the whole law on this. So if your Jesus don't have the whole law in his power, that's not Jesus. Your Jesus who says love, 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 but there's no discipline, wrath, or judgment, that's not Jesus. And we've taught a, not we, they've taught a Luciferian version of Jesus. One who is restricted to location. 
And the reason that's a Luciferian idea is because if you get into your history, then you know that the fallen angels or the watchers that came down, that they were restricted to mountain and geography. Which is why the woman said, do we worship on this mountain or that mountain? Because they, 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 they were gods appointed to uh, mountains. This is what the Sumerians called the dragon gods or the Anunnaki. No, 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 no. We, God's not restricted to a mountain. When you restrict Jesus to a location, like Sunday morning service, that is a Luciferian version of Jesus. And whether that was taught to you or that's just how you act on what was taught to you, that ain't the real Jesus. He said true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. You're not restricted to a mountain. It's everywhere you are. And the Lord is seeking that. And if he has not found that in you, it means you ain't of him. Yeah, that's tough talk. Uh, if you restrict Jesus to location verbally, that church talk. I can only talk about Jesus if we talk in church talk. You know what I hate? I hate folks who tell me, just talk about what you're good at. Don't talk about politics. Don't talk about life. What? Politics makes laws for all of life. Jesus gives you a new life, and that should flow into everything you touch. So why can't I expose a liar that's trying to govern what Jesus told me I could have? Uh, there was always a prophet next to the king. So when you say don't talk about politics, you're trying to restrict Jesus to one little conversation. Uh, when you say don't, don't, don't talk about real life, you're trying to restrict Jesus to one little location. You want me to talk about the cross, but not your bedroom. You want me to talk about the cross, but not your wallet. You want me to talk about the cross, him being the father, but not your parenting, and how you should whoop your own kids. Or how you should pay your child support. Quit changing the gospel, talking about my kids different. They don't need a whooping. Yes, they do. And you need a whooping. All y'all kids need whoopings. They do. The Bible says that he who spares the rod hates his child. It says that the, the heart of a child is filled with folly, but the rod of correction purges the innermost being. You cast demons out your child with the whooping. Because your child don't know how to seek deliverance. Your child don't know how to chase after an altar. Your child don't know how to get free of that thing that's oppressing them. You let them play with imaginary friends and then they stop talking in the house. You know what they need? They probably need a whooping. Because it purges the innermost being. This is why after you whoop a child, all the parents who whoop their kids, let me get an amen. This is why when you whoop your child, afterwards they can't breathe, they're like, and they're gagging because the word unclean spirit means current of air. This is why when you're in a worship service, sometimes you start sneezing uncontrollably or coughing or gagging. It's because something is coming out. That's why they got all this snot. How you kicking all that mucus all of a sudden? That's called the nesting. You can't get that out with a suction cup. Jesus said the whole law is satisfied on two laws. He satisfied the whole law with two laws, two witnesses, two immutable things. The reason he reduces the whole law to two laws, yet it covers the whole law, is because the more laws you write, the more difficult it is to escape from sin. The more complicated you make it, the more opportunity you have to fail, which is why it's called the laws of sin and death by Paul, because the more rules I give you, the more opportunity you have to fail. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if I tell my kids to clean the kitchen, and they go do the dishes and leave, and I say, why you ain't clean the kitchen? They say, I did. And I can say, oh, okay, you misunderstood what I was saying, right? That's covered in grace then. Today, <laughs> but tomorrow when they wake up, it's going to be a list on the fridge. Clean the kitchen means 
go through the house and collect all the dirty dishes. <laughs> Living room, bedroom, porch, backyard, find every cup, plate, napkin, everything. You better wash them napkins. <laughs> wash the dishes, dry the dishes, put the dishes away, wipe down all the counters, wipe behind the sink, wipe off the stove, take the grates off the stove and wipe in the rings. Sweep the floor. Take the trash out. This is what cleaning the kitchen means. And then once you get done, do the microwave and then rinse the sink out and get the food out the little cup holder thing and throw it down there. If there's food on the stove, put it in Tupperware and wash them pots. That's what, now, the more things you write down, the more opportunities they got to miss one. And once they miss one, it's, it's going to be butt whoopings. So Jesus took all of that law and said, we're just going to put on these two laws, and these really cover everything. Because these laws bring life, that law brought death. What that law didn't have the power to do, Jesus had the power to do. So love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do these, you have satisfied the whole law. So the more categories, the more pressure. Um, and the problem with that, the more categories, the more oppression, is then you can confine freedom to, to a category. Meaning I could be free in my finances but bound in my marriage. I could be free from sin but bound to lust. Because we have now broken everything down to compartments. And then I took Jesus and put him in this compartment. Church talk, Sunday morning. This or that. So then I can, on Sunday, act like this, but never get free. I'm free in this particular area, the one that I surrendered to him. But the Bible tells us that when a stronger man comes by and there's a strong man that's guarding the house, the stronger man binds him and then takes run of the house. We have eliminated giving God the run of the house. We say, yeah, God, you can come in, but I'm still driving. This smaller Luciferian version of Jesus this Jesus Copperfield, if you will. <laughs> That's what we turn them into. Jesus Blaine. Jesus Angel. Jesus the Magician. That I want to come into your stage, watch you perform. Do some special tricks for me. Bless my money. Touch my body. Do a couple miracles. Show me a sign. And then I leave and I don't have to submit to you. People leave and they enjoy David Copperfield, but they don't owe him nothing. Right. Oh, this, is, this is the version of Jesus that we have been taught uh, throughout the years by the previous church and, and some of the current church, which is a Jesus who has power to perform, but no authority that we have to submit to. Right. That he'll move on your behalf and then give you grace for living how any way you want to. What, what kind of God is that? What kind of king is a king who don't rule nothing? What kind of father is a father who, who, who is not the patriarch and the disciplinary of the home? Who is he who is not in control? How can we say oh, everything happens for a reason and God is in control, but he ain't even in control of you? Ain't even in control of your mouth, in control of your situation, in control of your finances. You ain't tired of talking about God going to take care of it. No, that's a thief, the Bible say. Made in the image of its father. Thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. See, that's the position of the devil. Power. Watch this flip. Watch this flip. Because the devil wants to sit in that seat. Remember I told you that. They teach you this version of Jesus, this Luciferian version of Jesus. What you really get is the devil. Because the devil has power. He just don't got no authority. So they taught a Jesus in this image. One that don't exercise authority but has all power. This is the devil. He's got power. That's why we have to submit to Christ to resist him. But he don't have authority because he's out of order. He is an outlaw spirit. He don't have no flesh to have been in the earth. The reason God spoke his word and it became flesh is because he gave the earth to man. So if you don't have flesh in the earth, you are out of line. So in turn... This version of Jesus 
that they have given us is an outlaw or a misfit in our society because they made it in the image of an outlaw spirit. So now when you mention Jesus, get him out of here. They have made him illegal. They have made him not fit in to current culture. Or it, it don't fit into your sex life. It don't fit into your, your, your personal beliefs. It don't fit into your finances. Why do we fight so much when, when the church talks money and, 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 and God at the same time? And, and we, we restrict and say, I'll tell you why. Because you can't serve both God and money. Money has become a God, and now Jesus don't fit into it. So you find a way to push him out as an outlaw. You make his bride an outlaw. Um, so, so, so then he's treated as a thief who's stealing your good time. His, his ministers are, are, are pictured as thieves stealing your money. Oh, because you tithe and I have a working vehicle, I stole your money? <laughs> That's how, that's, how, that's, how, that's how it is. Look what he driving. Look what, the, look what you driving. What you do? What, how you got a Mercedes and you work at McDonald's? How you, how, how, how you an ad, ad, admin and you got a Benz truck or you got a Cadillac es, uh, Esca, Escalade? You don't even do nothing but file papers. I'm trying to reach the lost. I'm preaching people out of addiction. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing people into the kingdom. So if I drive a Toyota, but it's shiny, I'm taking your money? This is how, this is how, but I'm not talking about y'all because we don't think like that here. And, and you know what, I ain't defending every pastor because some of them do be thieving. <laughs> I just ain't the one to talk about it because I don't know their money. I don't talk about that which I don't know. Just, I don't speculate what a man do. My grandmother said, I know what I do. That's what I believe. But we have then tur turned turn the image of, of Christ and the image of his, his, his shepherds and the image of his church into that of a thief. He wants to steal your good time. He wants to steal your money. He wants to take all the joy from you. Well, how are you going to paint Jesus as a thief? There is one that's a thief. Uh, he's painted as weak and defeated. A little pansy Jesus. A little manicured Pedicure Jesus, little blush on his cheek, Jesus, little. That's what the pictures look like. Jesus, who who can't save you from nothing? Who can't? I mean, think about how the world looks at our God. But 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 guess whose image that really is? Weak and defeated. That's the serpent. Who who who? The end from the beginning is already known. He's already defeated. So so Jesus, when he's actually painted on images, is painted as an angel of light. A little aura behind him. No, 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 there's one that presents himself like an angel of light. And it wasn't Jesus. And he's painted as a liar. The Bible's contradictory. This is what they say. Oh, oh, how can he say this and they say this and that? No, 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 there is a liar. So the smaller Luciferian version of Jesus that has been demonstrated to the world is a problem because the devil wants to sit in that seat. And he has begun to Sit in the temple of God. Sit in the place of God, being worshipped by the people of God. But they call him Jesus. But this is us. Kings. Priests. Chosen generation. Royal priesthood. Heirs of God. Co-heirs of Christ. Right? The problem that we, we experience now that no other generation has had to experience or no other generation would even understand, which is why a cookie cutter word just don't prepare us the way it needs to. We don't, look, look, listen, we don't, this generation, we don't need to be prepared to be parents. We need to be prepared to be prophets. We don't need to be prepared to be spouses. We need to be prepared to be prophets. We don't need to be prepared to be CEOs. We need to be prepared to be prophets. We don't need to be taught how to be pastors. We need to be prepared to be prophets because in these days, by those two witnesses, we have something to declare for a set time, for a short time. And the problem that we experience that no one else has understood is that prophets, uh, the reason we got to be prepared is that prophets bear a heavy weight being privy to all the pain and loss before everybody else is. That trailblazing is a burden. 
because I've got to figure out a new, a new road that no one has walked on before while then turning around trying to convince people to follow me on it. So I got to fight you and I got to fight the path. And so, so, so prophets have, have this weight that they have to carry that's not easy. And if you are not prepared, finding out all the pain before anyone else sees it coming is devastating. You see, see, two of us holding it together is easy. A generation standing up under a burden together, we can do that. If you're with it, I'm with it. But when you are a forerunner, when you are one like John the Baptist, make, making a way in the wilderness, declaring his coming, it, it's a different thing. Your food ain't as tasty. Your garments are a little more rugged. Your life ain't as comfortable. And there is a weight and a burden. And if you are not prepared to carry it, you will fold to the smaller Jesus. It's unknown territory. Think, think you're fighting on two fronts. Let's, let's look at some of the prophets in Scripture. Look at Noah. Only one knew what was coming. That wasn't a problem. It took him years to build that boat. He knew it was coming. But he didn't really know the weight of what was coming. It's easy to do what God told you to do till you hear the screams. It's easy to do what God told you to do till the knocks start coming. When, you start, when, you, when people start begging you to be a part of what you have going on and you got to reject them, it, it's, it's, it's easy to do it when we're just knocking some wood together. It's a whole other thing to do it when i got to bury the bodies. So you find that when he comes off the boat, the first thing he does is plant a vineyard and then gets drunk and is naked in his tent. This is not the habits of this man. He just diligently built an ark that no one had ever seen before. Years of focus, years of discipline. And now he's in his own tent, butt naked, passed out, drunk. Right off the boat. Now, what would drive a man to that? To get so drunk, he's just ripping his clothes off and kicking stuff over until he pass out. I mean, that's drunk, drunk. That's, that's, that's drunk. That's, that, ain't, that ain't party drunk where you don't remember the night before. That's drunk drunk where you let your whole inner soul out. Where if someone had walked in, you would have punched them in the face. There's holes in those walls. There's things that are broken you ain't going to never get back after those nights. Uh, Moses, think of Moses. After all he, he did and, and was a forerunner, hearing from God, leading the people, pulling the people, hearing from God, seeing the people, all this. He didn't even get to the promised land because when it was time to get one more drink, he couldn't ask no more. He just beat on the thing. Jeremiah in prison. When no one would listen to him. See, see, if we ain't prepared, we fold. Because Jeremiah was a true prophet but was surrounded by false prophets. And you could easily slide over to the prosperity side. And I ain't talking about prosperity gospel. I'm talking about where you ain't got to carry no weight. I'm talking about selling out, talking about I'm, I'm trying to get the bag or, or want God to bless my business. That's cool. That's cool. But if that's your priority, then he ain't your priority. Because if he was your priority, that stuff follows you. Uh, but if that's your priority, you follow that stuff, and he just got to tag along. So, so, so we find Jeremiah in the prison talking about, God, you deceived me. You overpowered me. So I declared I wouldn't preach your word no more. And I tried not to, but when I sat on it, it was like fire shut up in my bones. Let me tell you something. That's great. That, that, but, but there was a period where he sat on it. There was a period where he was like, I'm done with this. Look at Elijah in the cave. Calls fire from heaven, kills 400 prophets of Baal. And then he goes and hides in a cave depressed, saying, God, I want to die now. David on the rooftop. Looking at Bathsheba. She said, oh, looking good today. Bathsheba in the bath. Ooh, Sheba. <laughs> Woo. Rubber dub dub. <laughs> the verse before that says this. At a time when kings went to war, David was on his rooftop. Why wasn't he at war? 
This was the time of it. Why ain't the witnesses out there declaring a thing? This is the time of it. Why, why, why are the witnesses on their rooftops looking at porn instead of in the streets declaring the fire? Jonah tried to run because he knew the burden. You understand? Jonah ran from God because he said, God, I'm going to go preach your word and you're going to forgive them. He said, like, I ain't with this. He already knew. I'm not going to go preach repent and, or you're going to kill him. I'm going to tell him you're going to kill him because then they're going to repent and you ain't going to kill him. And then I'm going to look like a liar. So I'm not doing it. So he runs, of course. You see what he runs into until he submits. Well, then while he's outside the city waiting for it to burn, a little tree sprout up. Give him a little shade and the heat for a day. Next day, because the tree died, he mad at God. Because the tree died, he want the city to burn, he mad at God. How, how, how is it that a prophet turned into someone wanting to see men die instead of seeing men repent? Because, because there's a burden that comes if you ain't taught to carry it. Look at Jesus in the garden. The Bible says he was distressed greatly. That he sweat blood, which is, a, which is a, a condition of extreme stress where capillaries in your skin break and your blood comes out, your sweat comes out pink and like blood. This is great distress where, where he, watch this, he go out three times like, why y'all sleep? Jesus didn't come in like pansy Jesus. Hey, wake up, buddy. <laughs> tired of this. You sleep again? <laughs> like, could, could, you can't even do it for an hour? Do you realize what I'm about to do? Like, literally, when I walk out of here, I'm walking to that hill. You can't, you can't pray right now? And his father let this cup pass from before me. This is, this is stress. Um, but Jesus then understood the training of, of the one who was coming, which is not my will, but your will. Nevertheless, I'm one of the witnesses. If I don't do it, they won't do it. So God has given us these two trees, right? And we got to worship them in these. And the enemy has his false witnesses and his false prophets, his antichrist spirit and his lie. So we must not worship in those. So a witness's job is to be heard, Yes. Um, but we should only be heard from what we hear from him, what we hear from him, what we hear from the witnesses. We shouldn't be pushing our own thing. Y'all remember the story of the boy who cried wolf? The boy who cried wolf goes a little something. Who, don't, who ain't never heard the story of the boy who cried wolf? Anybody never heard it? Cool, so I'm going to tell it. Just in case somebody on the internet ain't never heard it. They don't tell fables no more, so, you know. The, the, the fable goes like there's a boy who's keeping some sheep, and he's bored. And while he's bored, he decides he can get a rise out of the city by yelling out, wolf. There's a wolf. So he cries out, wolf. And the whole city comes, the little town comes with the porch, the porch fix, with the <laughs> pitchforks. <laughs> with the pitchforks, and they, and, they, and they run up after him and, and get there, and he's just laughing at him. He does it again. And they're just laughing at him. He's just laughing at them. Third time, the wolf comes, and he yells out, wolf, and nobody comes. Yeah. That's, that, that, that tells you don't, don't lie, yeah. right? When did we lose this lesson that when someone tells us a lie and then does it again, we stop coming? Yeah. When did we lose, lose that lesson? Yeah. There's two lessons there. The boy shouldn't lie, but the people, we should have learned stop responding to the lie. And somewhere we lost that lesson, and we have allowed people who have a reputation of lying organize and orchestrate our lives. That friend that you keep, that keep a lie, you know they lie to other folks. Guess what? They, that that means they're lying to you. They keep a lie on them. They didn't lie to you multiple times, but you still deal with them. Uh, CDC? Fauci? NASA? Hollywood? Every politician, yeah. Biden, yeah. Trump. Yeah. When did we lose the understanding that when people are lying to us, we stop responding to their voice? 
See, the Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He blinds minds. Understanding that hearing affects sight. This is why the witnesses are important. Because hearing affects sight. What you hear determines what you see. Uh, you don't believe it because you think you... Let me, <laughs> let me prove it to you. And see, 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 somewhere, 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 y'all got that Godfather theology instead of Father God theology. Godfather theology says, believe none of what you hear, half of what you see. Father God theology says, believe none of what you physically see. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by a word. So walk by faith. It's a reverse. So, so, so here, let me, let, me, let me prove it to you. Uh, there's a thing called missing context. If you got Facebook or, or Instagram, you know this term by now, missing context. Here's, here's what, they, what they are saying. They're saying you put up an image that someone's going to uh, determine a belief by. So we're going to put a sound underneath it. We're going to put words to it so that we can paint the picture for you. We don't like the picture you're painting, so we're going to put this missing context. Ask me for context. Here's da, 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 da. So by the time they get done reading that and looking at what you said, what you tried to communicate is changed. Context. Context is given to a thing, and it shapes how you see it. Um, understand that Eve heard something before she saw something. She heard the serpent say, you're not going to die, before she saw that it was good for food. Because just earlier, if you had just caught her a few minutes earlier, God said, if you eat that, you're going to die. And that's how she saw it. The serpent comes in and says, you're not going to die. And that's how she saw it. Because what you hear, when she changed sounds or changed sources of information, it changed how she saw the exact same thing. It, it was the same tree. But she changed who she was listening to. Because your faith comes by hearing. So here comes this enemy. He's an imitator. Yes, we do know how he presents an image. But he said, I can be like, before he actually tried to present himself like. Because what you hear shapes what you see. He was a murderer from the beginning. Uh, this is what the scripture says. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do the father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. It has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Understand what Jesus is saying is he ain't just a murderer from the beginning, but he was a liar too. Um, his tongue, his sound, uh, what he put out to shape what you see because he blinds minds. This is what he does. He does it with a lie. This is why he, he walks around like a roaring lion. Not like a ruling lion. He always got his mouth going. He always keep a lie running. He deceived the whole world, the Bible says. And so, so you understand that a forked tongue comes before a forked road. That before you got to decide, eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, came a lie that said the opposite of what God said. A lot of times you end up making decisions based off of a lie, and that's why you end up in dead ends. And then you're trying to fix stuff within your own life. What do I got to do? How do, how do I cut this? No, no, no. You need to cut the sound out. And here, here let me help somebody else because, because uh. listen, we read stuff. And then when we communicate it to people, we say, I heard this. Because when you read it, guess what you hear? You hear, even if you read silently, you hear. So when you read information, you tell people you heard about it. That's why television ain't called a picture box. It's called tell a vision. Because they are giving you a picture through words and context to tell you what to believe. The Bible says, let me get some keys up here in about five minutes. In about five, maybe seven, maybe nine and a half. Listen. <laughs> the Bible says, it tells a story that we, that, that we love quoting one direction, but there's a, se there's a second direction to it, okay? It says that, that you, you'll go to dinner, and, and, and the host says to you, um, eat, eat all you want, but then he secretly is, is taking an account of everything you're eating. It says, for how a man thinks in his heart, so is he, okay? So, so it's telling you that it's not that he's giving you all the food. It's that in his heart, he's taking an account. He is not generous. 
He is who he is in his heart. So, so the, the way we love to, to, to communicate it is how a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we should always repair our heart before God so that who we are out here overflows out of that. But there is another side that lets you know that you have to look what's in a man's heart and not what comes out of his mouth. That, that, that what's coming out of his mouth is not the thing you should judge him by. But the truth of what the words coming out of his mouth is really based on what's in his heart. He can give you a fact to be deceptive. Jesus says it like this constantly when, you, when dealing with what you hear because the witnesses need to be heard, therefore we need to hear clearly. Uh, he said, you have heard it said, dot, 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 but I tell you. He said, let me take out what you think you know and let me give you truth. This is what you have always heard, but I'm going to tell you it's this, right? Um, he is called the word. He said, my sheep know my voice. Uh, the voice of another they won't follow. He says, if you say to that mountain, not if you can see that mountain. If you say to that mountain, then that'll change how you see that mountain because it'll remove itself. Then you'll see a flat plain. Who are you, great mountain, that you won't become a plain before Zerubbabel? Um, he, says, he says to his disciples when he's walking, he says, who do men say that I am? This is what he said. What y'all heard? Who are you listening to? What have you heard? Because you're going to look at me according to what you heard. And then John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say some prophets. Here's the next question. Who do you say? So now that you have heard what they said, what do you believe? This is Jesus' evaluation of them. And this is a two-pronged question. What have you heard about me? And based on that, what do you believe about me? This is the confrontation that we should all take to ourselves because we are his witnesses. Y'all not my witnesses. Right? right? Uh, it's not me that's the olive tree that feeds you. When I become your olive tree, you, you a dry lamp. So he says, what have you heard about me? And then based on that, what do you believe about me? And here's the, 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 he says, you got two sources of information that can affect what you think about me. One is what you heard. The other is what I said. So... You got them trying to tell you what their theology is. What, do you, what have I said to you? What, right? and, then, and then watch this. I love this because the other part of it is, who do you say that I am? Who do they say that I am? Well, what was your response to them? Who did you say I am? What are they hearing from you? So, so because what you're hearing is what you're putting back out. If they said John the Baptist and you said, yeah, John the Baptist, we got a problem. If they said, if they said Elijah and you said, sounds like Elijah, we got a problem. But if they said, uh, one of the prophets, he said, no, he's the son of the living God, the Christ who came in to save us, we're going to build the church on that rock. He said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you because the Holy Spirit, of course, is going to tell us what he hears from the Father. And the thing about it is what may be known about God is plain to see, right? Um, that's why it ain't really uh, a, a tough thing to identify what you see by God's word. Because what's plain about God is plain. Invisible attributes, they're plain. If, if you got to give me a long story to explain it, it's a lie. Yeah. Oh, see, look, 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 let me get, let me get uh, some toes in here that need to get, get them get woken up. Listen, if it's a long explanation for why something is, it's a lie. The Bible says that the invisible qualities of God are made plain to man. So man is without excuse. That means that I can look up and see how God made everything. This is why Sumeria mapped the stars before NASA did. Because they could just look up and see how things are plainly made. Now, if you need a whole CGI Hollywood producer to come in and produce graphics for me to tell me how a universe works and it does this and, it, and it's all these words that no one understands but you, you are a liar. Because it's plain. God's truth is plain. Yeah, let that sit on you. Um, and so if I read the Bible and all truth comes from these witnesses, this, witnesses, this witness says that he took the greatest light and the lesser light and all the stars and put them inside the firmament. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have a choice. Jesus or Luciferian Jesus. I try to fit this scripture into their lie. The seven days really wasn't seven days. It was probably macro evolution. 
Oh, we don't know how long a day was. Maybe that day was millions of years because God's outside of time. Oh, you're trying to fit Jesus into the lie. Bring the incorruptible down to the corruptible. No, no, no. What's known of God is plain to see. They didn't exchange the picture. They exchanged the truth. It's the same sky. It was the same tree. It's the same breath. It's the same migration patterns. Waters flow in the same directions. They didn't exchange what they saw. They exchanged the truth for the lie. When you look up, you still see the same thing. No matter what cartoons they put in the book. What difference would it really make? Except for you exchange the truth for a lie. And that's in everything. And when you exchange the truth for the lie, what you hear changes the picture you see. And while the witnesses sit quiet, we've allowed the world to remove the heavens and replace it with space. We allowed the world to remove the throne room of God, his firmament, his handiwork, and replace it with the great architect of the universe at the Masonic Lodge. We allowed the world to, to, to exchange and remove the idea that God flooded the earth with local floods and bite off stories of Gilgamesh. We allowed them to exchange the truth for a lie. We allowed them to take the rainbow and let it mean something about somebody draws versus the covenant with God. And we sit silently. Oh, let's, let's take a step back. We allowed them to take the rainbow and preach that it was to remind you of your covenant with God, which is also a lie. Oh, no, you ease into big lies with small lies. Bible says that God put his bow in the sky so that he would remember his covenant. You understand that every time you see a rainbow, God is reminding himself that he will not bring destruction on this earth like he did before. It is the grace of God. It is not your reminder of his promise. It's his reminder to himself of his promise. Because when he looks down, this world is filled with wickedness. Is it time to pour out the bowls of wrath yet? No, I still got my rainbow there. See, what's going to happen when the sky gets cracked is the firmament gets broken. Once the firmament gets broken, there will be no rainbows because there will be no prism to refract the light. The reason the rainbow is a, is a bow is because the prism is a, is a bowl. And when he cracks that firmament, cracks that sky, and we don't need no sun and moon no more because that let there be light from verse 2 replaces the greater light and lesser light from verse 14. And we don't need that no more. So in the book of Revelations, there will be no sun and moon. It'll just be light all the time because his light is shining from behind the firmament. And there will be no need to put a covenant there no more to remind himself because those days are done and now he's pouring out his wrath on all unrighteousness. Y'all ever heard of, and I'm sure you have because you go to this church, Pavlo, I know a couple people know what I'm talking about, Pavlo's experiments in psychiatry. Uh, two of them, one of them was the dog salivating, the salivating dog. If you're not familiar with this, what this was is, is that they would uh, ring a bell, ding, and then they would feed the dog. Ding, then they feed the dog. Ding, and then they feed the dog. So that the dog started associating the sound with the time. Get this, witnesses. Holy Spirit, the Word of God, through you, there is a sound that indicates the time. If you are silent, no one knows it's time. Ding. They wait for the food. Now, what they did was they started dinging the bell and wouldn't put the food out. When they hit the ding, the dog's mouth still salivated as if food was coming. They conditioned the dog to salivate at the sound. Whether food came or not, ding. The bell became a lie, but the mind was conditioned to respond to the bell. 
They did another experiment with the dogs where they put a dog on a floor with a wall between the, the floors and they were both electrified but were turned off and they would hit the ding and then they would shock the floor. So once the floor shocked, the dog would jump over. Ding, shock the floor, the dog would jump over. The dog soon learned that when you hear the ding, jump over to avoid being shocked. So, ding, he jumped over, didn't get shocked. Then they started electrocuting both sides of the floor. Ding, the dog jumped over and landed on shock. Jumped back over, landed on shock. After a few times of that, the dog just laid on the floor no matter how many times they rang the bell. They conditioned him from, for hopelessness. So they understand that there is a sound that can bring people to a mindset of hopelessness. They understand that there is a sound that can encourage a response even if they're lying. Why else would these studies need to be done? Uh, because God, by two immutable things, swore on himself, he cannot tell a lie, confirmed it with an oath, so now we have this hope that is an anchor for our soul. His witnesses bring in hope that is an anchor for our soul. The lie of the enemy brings in hopelessness and moves you through with a lie. Whoop, whoop. There's the sound of the police. Let's talk about a ding. Whoop, whoop. There's the sound of the police. Listen, so in slavery, somebody say violence. In slavery, on the plantation, you had us, all the slaves in the field or doing whatever they was going to do. And you had, you had a, one master or uh, overseer on a horse going through making sure things were getting done. Overseer, sim similar to officer, which is why the role of, that, that, that they have painted officers in is in the same behaviors as an overseer on a plantation. And it's become more and more evident that they were never established to secure safety for the people. Now we need police because people are foolish, period. I ain't one for the defunding nonsense and, and, and all them witch movements marching around and all that, and I ain't with all that. But I am one to expose a lie. Because when it goes from ensuring my safety to kicking me out of restaurants for not wearing masks or having a vaccine, now it's about control. Now we see that the whole point was to make you on the plantation of which you have thought we were all slaves. Mind you, I'm talking about the enemy and the controllers, not the police officers. Overseer, the sound, we're used to officer. Overseer, this is KRS-One. Overseer, overseer, officer. This is how this walk walks out. Now, now think of this. The slave catcher, if a slave ran away, the slave catcher was law enforcement. Law enforcement. It, they were legally uh, bounty hunters or deputized to go and catch slaves and bring them back to the plantation. Now you condition people to think that the police are here to keep control on the slaves. Which is why you can see the animosity between uh, particular races and the police. Pol police comes from a word that means policy. Somebody say policy. Ding. Means policy. Um, the District of Columbia Organic Act of 1871. We're going to walk it out. We're going to get a little violent, right? The District of Columbia Organic Act of 1871 established Washington, D.C., cut out a square mile as its own government, of which you can create federal government from or occupation. If you read this, then what you find out is that in this act, they incorporated the United States of America as a business that's run out of Washington, D.C., which became its own nation state. Now, 
out of that business then, they create departments. Let me, let me read you some of our U.S. law real quick, because this is policy. This is what, ding! This is the plantation. This is the lie. And we sit here and believe something different. And we let this lie tell us we can't operate in his truth. Listen to this. Uh, 28 U.S. Code uh, 3002 Section 10 says, person, when you read this bill, the person includes a natural person, including an individual Indian, a corporation, a partnership, an unincorporated association, a trust or an estate, or any other public or private entity, including a state or local government or an Indian tribe, person. So when you think that the law, when it says person, is defending us, and you look up and you see corporations making the decisions for what's happening in the world, it's because the laws were set up by this, by this act of 1871 to defend the corporations for the corporation. Section 15 says, United States means a federal corporation, an agency, department, commission, board, or other entity of the United States, or an instrumentality of the United States. If you read this out, ding! Overseer, officer, police, policy. The first police department in the United States was established in New York City in 1844. This is not a concept that goes back hundreds of years. 1844 is when we had our first police department. Of course, it had to be developed and trained and built up after uh, or coming up into the act of 1871. Other cities soon followed suit preparing them in New York, New Orleans, Cincinnati by 1852, Boston and Philadelphia by 1854, and Chicago and Milwaukee. They planned this entrance. The rulers of this world, spiritual wickedness in heavenly realms, planned this entrance. As, as we grew up, we called the police different things. Pigs. What's a pig, scripturally? It's an unclean animal. Um, what do we associate pigs with in scripture? Legion, demons. What do we associate pigs with in literature? Hannibal, animal farm. So now, there is a, there is an, a, a, a thing that's been prepared for us. Officer, overseer, we hate them. Police enforcing this policy from those who are taking advantage of us, we hate them. Those pigs, they're evil. We hate them. When I was growing up, it was Popo. One time. The boys. <laughs> the boys is coming. And you get that saying, you're not one of the boys. Today, it's 12. If you're over 40, you might not know that but they call the police 12. Pastor, what you talking about? Ding. I'm talking about a, 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 a world where there's a prince of the powers of the air that learn how to manipulate people with a lie and by association with sound. That they can train you that a thing is negative by association officer associate with the overseer boom and by the time they teach you to hate police in today's society then they start calling them 12 and it's an entrance they made they've been doing that for a couple of years now whoop whoop that's the sound of the police so now we associate this negativity with 12. this is how smooth the snake moves this took hundreds of years to do to get to this point where the witnesses would need to have the truth the, 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 the word of God and the spirit of God so that we could declare fire that would consume an enemy. But if we don't have the truth and we've been conditioned to a mindset, for instance, 12, now associated with something society says is bad and something that we need to defund and something that we don't like and something that we resist. Used to enforce all kind of negative this and that, whatever. Well, here's what I know about 12. Jesus chose 12 disciples. 
So how is that a negative thing? Uh, here's what I know about 12. That when Elijah found Elisha, he was plowing on 12 yoke of oxen. I don't, I don't, I don't understand how, how, how we can associate this negativity and you trying to ride us to a way and call good evil and evil good because uh, God chose 12 tribes of Israel. And last I checked, we catch Jesus being discipled up when he was 12 years old in the temple. But if by association I can make you hate a thing, that when you read it, even though I never said this, you read it with a negative slant because you've always viewed a word differently. You won't die. It's, it's a cunning thing how this world works. Obama. Obama. Such a big deal, Barack Obama. It's got two slants to it. Those who were for Barack Obama, shout out Obama Nation. Abomination. They're abomination. They don't even realize what they're cheering. Just by a few choice words. Do you think someone in the crowd came up with that? If, if it came, if it, if it trended, it was set up. It was handed to you. The other side would never say abomination. You know what they would say? They want to emphasize Barack Hussein Obama. Because they, because they want to associate him with negativity, like Saddam Hussein. The problem with that is the word Barak in the Hebrew means praise. So now, your hatred, trying to associate a man, you have associated praise with something you hate. And then the abomination of desolation sits in your temple, in the place of God being worshiped as God because you hate him more than you love him because you worship him more than you worship him it's a sleight of hand it's a forked tongue it's just a smaller unrecognizable lesser Jesus so that the witness will never stand up and declare out of their mouth the truth we will preach Donald Trump and we will preach Barack Obama but we won't even mention Jesus Christ amongst those we work with we will look at the Word of God as contradictory only because you gave me negative association Bing, 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 from one method to another through slow manipulation now listen if you can't make the connection you got to go pray about it because there's an enemy who blinds the minds. And Jesus said, you can't hear me because you're not of me. Barak, praise, who's sane? It's crazy to praise God. It's a, it's, it's a word game because they're witches. It's a hypnotism that has happened over the people we can't even see because we've been hypnotized with their words. So here's my question. What dings have, have triggered us? What dings have triggered us? Don't worry, I'm almost done for y'all who, who got low, low metabolism and low uh, stamina. For, for, for all y'all who got to hurry up and get back to your couch or, or your food, I'm almost done. What dings have triggered us within the church? Here's one, church. Hypocrite, ding. Liar, ding. Actor. So when you hear the church now, people have been conditioned, ding. That it means you a hypocrite. Church, ding. They want your money. Church, ding. Oh, they're just like the world. Church, ding. They're so judgmental. They're so judgmental. Now, you know what? Judgment is only on those they only feel judged when they have decided that this is who they're going to be forever. It's accountability otherwise. It's correction otherwise. It's only judgment if you've decided that how you are today is how you're going to die. Now, now because you won't change, you feel judged because it's like your end right now. Judgment. Ding. Church. 
Oh, church is man-made. Ding, the Bible is man-made. Ding, our religion was created to control. Ding, we don't need it to know God. We don't need church to know God. Ding. It's just a show. Ding. It's just a club. Ding. There's another sexual scandal. Ding. So now whenever you hear church, your conditioning leads you to hopelessness. The world's condition, and unless there is one who stands with his witnesses, pushing out a hope that is an anchor to the soul. Look, when we hear praise, and we say, put your hands up, you can't because, ding, you was just at a concert and you had your hands up. You can't because, because the police pulled you over and said, put your hands up. So when you stand in the church and we say, lift up your hands, ding, I'm not doing it because you have associated it with, with capture and sin. When we say, clap your hands, you won't because of the last atmosphere you was in. When we say, dance before the Lord, you can't even muster up a two-step because last time you was dancing, you was in the club. The church, it's a club. Ding! Last time I was dancing, it was sexual. The church always has a scandal. Ding! Prayer or worship. We let them tell us, I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. I'd rather live on my knees than have to walk this thing by myself. So, so the world has taught us, don't bow down, fight for yours. No, the Lord said, be still and know that I am God. That the battle is not yours. Sermons. We used to be in the classroom. 12 years growing up. Each class is about 40 minutes. And then the bell rings, ding. Another class, 40 minutes, ding. Another class, 40 minutes, ding. You get this your whole life growing up. You're conditioned five days a week. And then you show up to church on Sunday. And if that pastor preaches more than 40 minutes, your conditioning kicks in. You start looking at your watch. This ain't how classes are supposed to work. I gotta go to, this is time for the bathroom break. This is time to go get some water from the water fountain. I'm not used to sitting here for more, ding, ding, ding. How are we gonna preach for more than 40 minutes? Songs, songs, they condition us for pagan worship. We sing songs like oceans, spirit lead me. When my faith is without borders, let me walk upon the waters. Ocean? That word ain't in the Bible nowhere. God said he laid the seas. Ocean comes from Oceanus, which is a Greek titan. It's another god. That's why this, I don't know if that's why, but in the song it don't say, Holy Spirit, lead me where my faith is without borders. How am I singing about another God saying, Spirit, lead me? Ding. And we don't even realize it because, because they called it oceans all your life. Didn't even tell you they named it after another God and changed the word God used in the Bible. Seas, Oceanus, true God, false God. We, we, we changed the God of heaven and earth to the God of the universe. So the God of all of creation, heaven and earth, to the God of imagination, which we're supposed to cast down imagination. Universe, what equipment do you even have that goes out far enough to capture this big picture that you took a picture of and painted for me and told me it was true? No, that's a faith system. You are a liar. I cast down that imagination. I'm not worshiping Helios. I'm not worshiping Sol, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or any other sun god that you want to exalt. No, that's Saturn, that's Satan, that's Apollyon, that's the one with the keys to the bottomless pit, that's the destroyer, and you ain't gonna have me in here talking about the God of the universe when that universe is full of false gods' names. That's Apollyon and that's a different God. No, my God is the God of heaven and earth. The earth is his footstool, the heaven is his throne. He is the Ancient of Days. Ding, 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 ding. 
and you can't even hear the truth because by the time you got saved they fed you evolution by the time you got saved they fed you uh, some solar system by the time you got saved they gave you all these ideas that now you gotta fit the truth into their life Ding. and here's the problem blinded minds cannot see That's why you have to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Because the Holy Spirit has anointed us to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to preach the good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind. So if blinded minds can't see, they don't need to hear your advice on their marriage. They need the gospel of the kingdom. If blinded minds can't see, they don't need to hear what you got to say about money or what kind of leisure or vacation you want. They need to hear the gospel of the kingdom. And by these two witnesses, by the word of God, by the Holy Spirit of the living God, by these two witnesses that, that, that I can declare it thing and the enemy can't even touch it that fire comes out that fire that was shut up in my bones like Jeremiah said that fire that you have to fan into, fan into flames like Paul told Timothy comes out and devours the work of the enemy but if they can shut you up through conditioning through false doctrines through lies and, and make-believe things that you can't even grab the truth and hold it and sell it not if they can shut you up then, then they can shut you out because now you can't even get in because they can't hear your truth they can't hear your words because they are of their father and you won't speak the truth you'll speak their economics but you won't speak his word you'll speak their family dynamics you won't speak his word you will speak about their pharmacy but you won't speak his word uh, uh, there's a problem there they didn't shut you up and they didn't shut you out You didn't conform when you should have been transformed. Jesus said, you're in this world. But you're like me, you're not of this world. So why you speak the language of this world? See, see, this, this stuff that I'm saying may sound silly. It may, it, it may send you down a few avenues of figuring out where we have been deceived. But the reality of it is it's the language of this world. And if you don't think that's a thing, you tell me why they tell you how to take over a culture is to take their language and take their gods. That's why Nebuchadnezzar said, teach them the language of the Chaldeans. That they're saying one thing, but guess what? In their heart. So are they that when they're sitting there talking about uh, where this is this and it looked like it's education it's not education the goal is deception and binding uh, he says one thing with his mouth but in his heart that's who he is who that lie is in his innermost being whoever established that thing what was their purpose because that's who they really are you got to have the ability here's something for you South Florida you got to have the ability to be bilingual you got to be able to hear what they saying in their false tongue so that you can translate it and declare a thing to open people's minds up with the word of God. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't change the word of God. No, 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 no. It ain't sex before marriage is a sin. Fornication is a sin. Fornication, pornos, pornania, but not sex. That's not even in the Bible. Not division, sectioned off, cut off, to cut into. No, 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 you gotta, you gotta not let them change and water down the word of God. So let every truth be established by two and three witnesses. I said two witnesses. Here's the three. The father sent the son. The son sent his spirit. And Jesus said, I'm sending you. Let every truth be established by two and three witnesses which is why scripture tells us that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That you are a part of establishing the truth with the witnesses. You are a part of the overcoming. Because otherwise, people are deceived by the lie. As cunning as it is, as subtle as it is, there is a conditioning that blinds the mind. As, as our young people wanting to be doctors and not worshipers and I ain't got no problem with a doctor but if you a doctor before you a worshiper you you can't touch my body got our young people wanting to be performers and not worshipers got our people wanting to wanting to uh, be, be, be sexually illicit but not husbands 
not wives, no covenant. They have removed the covenant. They have removed the truth. And if we're quiet, or we only have half the story, or we, we're deceived, then we can't even hear the truth. The truth ain't in them. If this world is run by a liar, and that's of his own character, Jesus said, then everything that he made us believe in the world system is a lie because there is no truth in him. Witnesses, y'all have the truth. You have the truth. Go out there and declare the truth. We have a short time. And then your witness is gonna be silenced for a time. If you want your people to hear it, tell it now. It's gonna draw attack, but then fire comes out and consumes it and devours the work of the enemy. Let the fire of God flow from you. Let the passion of God flow from you. Demonstrate the power of God. Demonstrate the glory of God. They can't touch you. You got the power to speak to the weather. You got the power to call down plagues, he says. There's a reason why last year we declared we're going to push the waters back. Why last year we declared we're going to divide the tongue. And in every hurricane that thought it was aimed over here, there was a church in South Florida that put his hand towards the water and declared you will not hit this land. That we break all of that. Ain't no Yorokladon going to hit this one. And there ain't been a hurricane hit here in three years because this church, these witnesses, had the power to call it down. Don't let nobody ever fool you that weather is, it just oops away. It ain't no oops away. Not when they got machines to control that weather and they, they want to hit us with it. When they technology fell at the feet of our God at the sound of your voice. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, God. We thank you that you have equipped us with your word. That you have filled us with your spirit. That you landed on us, God, in tongues of fire. And we can declare that fire. Father, we can consume the works of the enemy, devour them. We tear down every lie. I pray for the people in this room, God, and the people that are watching on the internet, that you would touch their eyes, that they would, that they would see according to your word, not according to this world. That you would show every thinly veiled thing that the enemy has tried to blind us with. That you would break the conditioning. Father, we renew our minds in you, in Jesus' name. That conditioned mind, we declare it passed away. That we are a new creation. We ask you, God, to touch our minds even now. Touch our minds even now, God, and break any veils and break any deceptions. Break any conditioning, any compulsive responses, any associated belief systems, God. That when we hear something, that it drives us emotionally. We call that into order in Jesus name that we can rightly devise your word of truth that we can declare your truth in this world for the time that you have for us in Jesus name Amen When you came in, you received an envelope. That envelope says tithe and offering. We're not one who buys into the lie that ours is ours. We're ones who understand the truth that everything we have comes from God. He put breath in our body. He postured us here with the ability to make income. And so when we give, it's worship to him. We don't give to an organization. We're not giving um, to a, a person we are giving to him is worship. Our tithe is our covenant. It should be understood that uh, whatever church you are a part of, it don't matter if that church takes the dollars out back, burns them in a fire, and makes s'mores with them. That when you keep your covenant with God, that when you release it out of your hand, it is received at his feet. And anyone who has any negative intention with it cannot undo the, the 
promise of God that is associated with his covenant. God regulates the harvest. You don't have to regulate the seed. That's your tithe. And then your offering is your sacrifice. It is, it is saying, God, I trust you. And I'm leaning more on you than I am on this. There's three ways you can give online or four. There's a cash app and all of those things listed. As you give, remember that is worship. Put your heart in a focus of worship. Break the conditioning that someone's stealing from you. Break the conditioning that this is a routine part of church. Break the conditioning that you don't have enough to get through and you got to uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. Break the conditioning of I have to eat this every Sunday after church. Break the conditioning. And let your worship flow. The Lord is seeking such. who Worship, which includes this in spirit and truth, be led of the spirit and by the word. Father God, we thank you for the privilege to give to you. Everything that we have comes from you. Father, we give you this portion back. We ask you, God, uh, that you use it for your kingdom, that you multiply it, that you do more with it than is humanly possible. Let it be a testimony of your glory. And Father, I pray for every giver. Father, that they would walk in your power and in your promise according according to, to your word, God, that you said you would open the windows of heaven, that you said you would pour out on them. Father, that you would meet the need of every living thing, giving us our food in due season. I pray that on every giver, Lord, that you would meet the needs, the needs of their heart, the needs in their mind, the needs in their family. Father, you're the Lord of the harvest, so you determine on how you bring it back to them, but you're faithful to bring it back because you cannot be mocked. In Jesus' name, amen.